opportunity to come and speak with you guys today. Let me do just a little bit, a little bit of feedback. All right. So uh, as, as Dan said, my name is Thomas Riddle and I'm the Assistant Director at Roper Mountain Science Center. And we always love the opportunity to come out and engage with the public and let people know what's going on at Roper Mountain. Um, as Despite the fact that Roper has been uh, really a, a vital part of the community for 30 years, there's still a lot of misconceptions. Yes, we are more than the Christmas lights that went away. Um, and I'll go ahead and take that question right now. Are we bringing them back? No, sorry. Um, people, have, we get that still. It's been five years already, and um, there was a great partnership with the Rotary. Um, Rotary, we were the host site, and the Rotary decided uh, that it had kind of uh, run its course, and um, it's allowed us to actually do a lot more with the community than just Christmas lights. And when people get on campus now, they say, wow, you are so much more. I've never seen all, all these other things. So that's what we're going to talk a little, a little bit about today. Um, so quick survey. Raise your hand if you have ever been to, to Roper Mountain. Fantastic. Raise your hand if you've been to Roper Mountain in the last five years. Great. Because in the last five years, we have done a tremendous amount of work uh, on our little mountain. And, you know, we have, as we like to say, we have big things going on on the little mountain. Some of us affectionately call it the hill because it's not much of a mountain, but it's a mountain to us. Uh, that's very dear to our heart. Um, we are, oops, oh, we had the presentation working. Let me see if it timed out, guys. We just tested that. Sorry about this. We... Well, well, she can. Hold on, I'll be right there. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Wow. Yeah, here's the thing. I was a classroom teacher for a long time. And anytime you try to use technology, you've got the best lesson you ever want to have, especially if it involves technology, you're going to have gremlins show up. And you just have to wing it, you know, modify, adapt, and overcome. We just tested that. I'm not sure what was going on. Probably user error. Still not getting anything. There we go. Perfect. All right. Sometimes you just have to unplug, wait 10 seconds, let it go again. Thanks a lot. So for those who uh, aren't aware, we are a very unique facility in the nation. Uh, we're part of Aztec, which is the Association of Science Technology Centers. So we regularly go to annual conferences around the nation. And we have looked for other resources like us that exist. And really, there's nothing else like this anywhere. Greenville is very blessed to have a resource such as this. Um, at, sitting on this 62 acre uh, campus that we are, the unique part is, is that it's owned and operated by a school district. Uh, there's a lot of school districts that will have a, a science center or they might have a little living history farm or something. But to have all the resources that we have that I'm going to go over with you in just a second is really unique. Uh, nationally. Our mission at Roper Mountain is to ignite the natural curiosity of all learners to explore and shape their world. And that came out of our strategic plan last, the last session we did, which was six years ago. Actually, we're starting our new strategic plan uh, coming up and actually I'm doing a session tomorrow, kicking up with our staff. But this mission statement came out of our last strategic plan, and I think it really does speak to the heart of what we like to do. Uh, you'll notice it's, it doesn't say to ignite the natural curiosity of children. It's all learners. And that really is something that we take to heart. Um, our vision is to be a pinnacle of innovative learning, an engine for community engagement, and a national leader in science education. We've taken that very seriously over the last several years, and we continue to get uh, make headway on the national scene. More and more people are coming to us from across the country to actually see what we're doing at Roper Mountain. Now, most of you said you know about Roper Mountain, but did you know, raise your hand if you knew it actually started as a failed state park. Was anybody there? I would love to talk and we're looking for pictures. We're always trying to find people that were. So, um, 
The Piedmont Exposition Center was part of the tricentennial of South Carolina. There were three state parks that were, were opened in 1970 to celebrate our tricentennial. There was Charlestown Park, or Charlestown Landing, which still exists. Uh, the Midlands Park still exists in Columbia. And then in the upstate, we had the Piedmont, um, P the Piedmont Exposition Park. Now, Buckminster Fuller, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with uh, Bucky Fuller and his work, but he pioneered the use of the geodesic sphere or um, triangles in construction. And Fuller was really one of the preeminent um, architects at the time in, in, in the world. And so we were actually able to get, we being the state park system, South Carolina was able to get Bucky to do the master plans for these three state parks, which is fantastic. And so... The idea was in Charlestown Landing would represent the first hundred years of South Carolina's history. The Piedmont, or the, excuse me, the Midlands Park would be kind of, kind of like the next hundred years up to the present. And then the Piedmont Exposition would be representative of the present to the future. So they wanted a bold, innovative design. So Fuller had just come off the 1968 World's, uh, World's Fair in Montreal and had created, I don't know if anyone's been to Montreal and seen this geodesic sphere that still exists. It looks very much similar to Spaceship Earth at, uh, at Epcot. So that's what he planned on top of our little mountain. We were going to have this massive sphere with a five-story museum inside of it. And the State Park Service said, well, you've already done that. We want something different. So he came up with something he called the Tetron, which was a cube. He'd never done it before. And it was going to look like a cube that was coming up out of the ground, shoved on a point out of this mountain. Um, Long story short, about three quarters of the way to completion on a very tight deadline. They had a July 4th, 1970 opening date. The builders realized that it wasn't going, the two sides were not going to meet. <laughs> and this was to be heated and air-conditioned space. This was plexi and aluminum. I mean, this was actually, this was an outer skin. And it was going to be short. So, of course, all the fingers started going, who would blame who, and Fuller said, I just gave you, you know, a plan. <laughs> you guys have to design it. Well, long story short, again, you'll notice here, it didn't quite get finished, and they opened anyway. Yes, sir? You ever talk to Bill Davis? Bill, yes. Yes, Bill, we've gotten information. Very interesting story about that. Yes, absolutely. Bill, Bill has uh, given us some information about that. So, yeah, it's a... Um, Fascinating story how all, all, how all that panned out. But uh, I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole now. This is cool. The night before, there was a massive thunderstorm and the top floor flooded. Uh, they spent all night trying to clean up the mess. And now, guys, this is, this, these were not, it was, this wasn't your typical museum installation. There were tracks that moved exhibitry from the ceiling. Uh, as, it, as it went throughout the different floors. Uh, there was a, a, a full facade of Fort Hill Plantation, Calhoun's home over at Clemson, told, that told the history of the upstate. So you kind of go into, you walk into the, um, end of the end of the building there and you saw the history. Really cool exhibits. Only a few pictures still, still exist we've been able to find. We've done research at this, the state archives, and you find tons of information, lots of pictures from the other two parks from this. It's virtually nothing on, on our park. It makes us wonder why. Well, um, after the, the kickoff and the celebration, the State Park Service asked if we could have money to, or they could have money to um, fix the structure and a new governor, Governor West, and the state legislature said, tricentennial celebration's over. You had your chance, no more money. So they had, to, uh, they had, they had no money to fix it. And so what happened is that they looked for a... a a buyer and the Greenville Zoo turned them down. Can you imagine that? Of course, you know that in 1970 there was nothing out there. Um, a few years later, 1974, this entire campus was sold to the school district of Greenville County for $5 with the promise that the assurance that it would only be used for educational purposes in perpetuity. Um, and so the superstructure came down, and you'll notice this building here that was all the exhibits were taken out, and we just had the inside building that remained there until the early 1980s. The first structure, once the school district had this facility, uh, the first structure to be built on this mountain was the amphitheater. Anyone remember the amphitheater at all? 
it was that was the place for outdoor concerts uh, back in the day. And when I first came to Ripper Mountain, actually when I first started working with the school district at the district level uh, back in the early 2000s, I was really hoping we could rehabilitate this, but it was just too far gone. Uh, and it was really part of a kind of mission drift as well. It really had nothing to do with what we were doing at the time with the center. Um, I'll come back to that story with that footprint of the amphitheater. But in 1982, Harrison Hall of Science, what is now Harrison Hall, uh, originally opened as a hort building. So if you were going to study hort horticulture anywhere in the school district, you came to Roper Mountain to the horticulture builder, building. The next year in 83, um, many of you may know Minor Shaw. Uh, Minor was served as the first president of the newly created Roper Mountain Science Center Association, which has been an invaluable partner for us over all these years. Um, their purpose was to fundraise uh, for buildings and and uh, make uh, raise money for staff, et cetera, for uh, the newly opened Roper Mountain Science Center. In 1985, Roper Mountain was officially opened uh, with the Living History Farm. I don't know if you remember, when the, some of you may remember, that that was all we had for a while. Daryl Harrison was our first, our first director and such... Daryl Harrison was our first director, and we stand on the shoulder of giants. I was going to say that whether you're going to be here or not. <laughs> um, Daryl, Michael and I, Michael Weeks is the director uh, currently. We, we scratch our heads sometimes when we, we do presentations like this to see how much was done in such a short amount of time directed uh, under the leadership of, of Daryl. So when we first opened in 85, that kicked off a flurry of construction projects. Um, in 87, the Daniel Observatory opened up with our massive 23-inch refractor telescope. And I always have to say that in honor of Greg Cornwell, because Greg used to always talk about this massive 23-inch telescope. And I was like, Greg, there's something that doesn't ma match up there, massive and 23 inches. But we're talking about the size of the lens. Uh, and it was built for Princeton originally in 1882. Uh, and of course, we've housed it here at Ripon Mountain since 1987. Strom Thurmond played a very, uh, very valuable role in helping us get that. And there's a whole good story about that. We actually had that. Strom was able to get that telescope donated to us. All we had to pay is $10,000 to transport it from where it was stored. The U.S. Navy got it from Princeton in the, in the early 60s and just mothballed it. And then we were able to get it at Roper Mountain. So it is a historic telescope. People still come from all over the world just to see this telescope. Um, in 88, Sims Hall of Science uh, opened. And then two years later, we had the Hooper Planetarium open. That in, in itself, that those three buildings were constructed in that short of time still just blows my mind. Um, in 1993, we began the Science Plus Institute, which is uh, a teacher training program that regularly uh, since that time, trains three to 400 teachers for free for them all over the state. They come to Roper Mountain. Uh, it's a residential program. We have partner hotels. They stay at the hotel if they're not local. And then we give them about $1,000 worth of materials and train them with master teachers how to use those specific materials in their classrooms. Uh, it's a fantastic program. Uh, and it began in 93. Wilkins Conference Center opened shortly after that in, in, in 2002. And then we started with our renovations that we'll talk about more in just a second. Now, how are these buildings built? Like I was just saying, what was amazing to me is that this was private fundraising by the association. Most people think that the school district built all of these buildings. Now, this was private fundraising by the association. One thing that we like to talk about in Greenville County, from the mayor to the superintendent, is the uniqueness of our, um, the level of public-private partnerships that we have throughout Greenville County that really has helped the county and the city develop. Uh, that is, this is an example of that, where we have private donors who have helped um, fund a public school facility. So if you'll notice, notice from 83 to 2018, more than $11.5 million was raised by the association uh, to build and support these programs at Roper Mountain. Now, again, if you haven't been here in a while, or even if you have, this is kind of an overview of our campus, just to kind of give you a, a bird's eye view. And the reason I mention this is because when people come, the last several years, it's been fantastic. When people have come, 
we get, oh, we're getting this comment a lot. They say, we feel like we are at Disney World, that this is the educational Disney. Uh, and that's, we take that as a, as a compliment because actually Michael and I were able to go to Disney a few years ago and meet with some Imagineers, talk about some of the things they do with switching um, spaces quickly. Uh, as far as theming goes and inspired some of the work that we're doing with a dinosaur trail in our new world. But seriously, we get called the educational Disney world. And really, you know, when we started, started thinking about it, we're like, you know, well, the top of the mountain with the planetarium, the observatory is kind of like Tomorrowland, Harrison Hall of Science and the, our natural science building, our, envi our new environmental science building is kind of like adventure land. And then we have the farm, which is frontier land. And, and from time to time, we are all, we turn the entire mountain into fantasy land. So it really is, uh, a unique space. The Living History Farm um, is probably remains one of the most popular spaces on the mountain today from field trips to the public. Uh, the most recent cabin that we had was right here uh, that was added in 2012, was the Williams Earl Cabin. We are the only project that the History Channel has funded in South Carolina as part of the Save Our History program. Um, and we always like to say, take that Charleston. You know, because Charleston, we always hear about everything with Charleston. I'm like, you know, but I'm like, we were the only one that received a grant for that. And we were very proud of that. That cabin was the last known standing slave cabin in Greenville County. It's going to get pushed over due to some development going on on Grove Road. This literally was downtown. And we were blessed to be able to discover the stories of the last family of slaves that lived there and followed their story into emancipation and how successful they became. Uh, and as well as we're able to tell the greater story of the African-American experience during that time in Greenville County. Uh, Sims Hall of Science is where we teach a lot of our physics, our chemistry, robotics, technology. We have our nice big hall in here where we do um, our auditorium. Where we do a lot of our uh, stage shows. Uh, the Hooper Planetarium. Oh, by the way, and that building was also renovated in 2012. We, we blew out walls and built all new classrooms. And the Hooper Planetarium was renovated in 2016. We up updated that with a new 4K projection system, cove lighting, surround sound. I mean, it is really um, one of the best planetariums in the Southeast now. We happen to be the largest planetarium theater in South Carolina. The Daniel Observatory, as I mentioned, um, was renovated over two years. Uh, really, part of, while we were shut down to the, to the public for COVID, we got a lot of work done. Uh, with some of these projects, and this was one of them. It's If you've ever seen the telescope before, we used to have to code to move it. Now it's literally a computer where it's point and click. So I have a, a, an image of the universe. I can just point a mouse and click it, and the, and the telescope will go right there. And then, of course, Harrison Hall of Natural Science was renovated in 2018 with a, with a great facelift. We updated our marine lab. You know, if you do not know, we have marine labs where kids can come pet sharks, touch stingrays, pick up horseshoe crabs and starfish. Now keep in mind that just under half of our student population that comes to Roper Mountain is on the poverty index. So we're providing experiences for kids that would not have these experiences otherwise. And then it takes us to the new building, the Environmental Science and Sustainability Building. We're very proud of this uh, because again, this is kind of a culmination of everything that was done before, um, before we came. This building is where the amphitheater was. So if you remember the amphitheater, you know, the, I told you it was before, excuse me, it was um, beyond really kind of repair. And so we wanted to minimize the footprint. It's not very sustainable if you go in and clear cut a lot of trees to build a new building, right? So we were able to pretty much remove that amphitheater and build this building. It was designed to go right in this footprint. We we were able that way to minimize the loss of our chestnut oaks, which are very unique. Uh, chestnut oaks are really found only two places in, in, in stands in Greenville County. Um, it's Ripper Mountain and Paris Mountain uh, has them as well. And I love that. I was just thinking today, they turn, when they turn, they're so beautiful. Uh, they're just beautiful trees in general. We did lose three large chestnut oaks, unfortunately. But when we did so, we said, well, let's try to find something we can do with them. You know, let's part of the sustainability story. So when you come to Roper Mountain, I'm going to say, I'm not going to say if, but when you come and you come into this building, uh, notice the staircase that goes from upstairs to downstairs, has these beautiful wood treads, and that flooring is from uh, those chestnut oaks. So we were able to reuse uh, some of the wood for that, and we have the rest in storage. Nature Exchange is a, a wonderfully popular program that we've, we've just started uh, in this new building. This is a program that comes out of Science North Museum in Toronto. 
They started it about 25 years ago. And I, I love this because um, kids can bring, let's say they go to the beach, they find a seashell. You bring your seashell in and you trade it for points. And then with those points, you can get things that we have like fossilized shark teeth or polished dinosaur bone or a myriad of other things that we have, natural things that they can take. Um, or I love this component too. They can save their points, talks about investment, and they can save their points to save up for larger things like a complete shark's jaw with all the teeth, like 25,000 points. Uh, so it's, it's a great way and, and to get kids interested. And here's the thing, you might bring the shell in, that might just be a, a little scallop, you know, or lettered olive. And then you say, you know, wow, if you can tell me what this is, and we have some books over there and some people to help you, you come back. Now, this is worth 100 points, but if you tell me, I'll give you 300 more points, you know. And they're like, oh, you know. And, and the points don't matter. It's the excitement. And, and you're like, and so some people are like, well, you know, that's encouraging them to take things out of nature. If they want to, they can also take pictures. They can draw pictures. They can write poems. We've had all of those things happen. So this has been wildly successful. We opened it uh, this past summer during our summer adventure, our new 10-week program. And just to give you an example, we now have over 17,000 traders. That's 17,000 individual accounts. Um, the next closest nature, uh, nature exchange is in Georgia. And they've had theirs about 10 years. And they have just under 17,000 in 10 years. We had 17,000 in 10 weeks. Um, it has been wildly popular. Our afternoon explorations program, which we've now opened for the first time at Roper Mountain, we're open to the public in the afternoons from 1.30 to 4.30, Tuesday to Friday. Uh, you can come with your kids, you can come alone. And one of the big draws is this, because kids want to come back and trade things. And the things that they, um, that they bring in, guess what we do with those? Well, we actually have a pine cone graveyard because we get lots of pine cones and acorns and and we call it the pine cone graveyard. We take those out way back to property and kind of rest in peace. Go back to, go back to nature. But some, we get some really cool things to be involved in. And those go into the collection that other people can then trade for. So it's a, it's a fantastic product, uh, project. Some other things that we have in this building for the first time at Roper Mountain, we have permanent exhibitry. Uh, so this is really one of the reasons that we can stay open to the public now more so. Uh, we have two major exhibits. One is our water story, which tells the story of, of the importance of protecting our watersheds, um, and especially the unique nature of Greenville's watersheds and, and the history of Greenville water and why we have some of what experts say, some of the cleanest water in the United States. And we're proud to say the best tasting water year after year in competitions, blind taste tests. Um, then this is a, also part of that uh, exhibit. So they talk, we talk about the natural processes of water as it flows kind of from the waterfall we have at the top of the, of the staircase and makes its way down. We talk about the water cycle. And then we talk about what happens to water when it comes into our houses and how it's purified and cleaned and then how, it's, um, how it goes back into uh, Rewa. And, and now that's interesting. You're wanting to make an exhibit about water being recycled, especially for kids, right? And so we worked hand in glove with Greenville Water and Rewa, which are the two major donors for this exhibit. And we said, hey, so how do you want to tell a story? They said, well, we always get this question, where does the poop go? And so we're like, that's right. So we embrace the poop and we tell that whole process, that story. It's fascinating, guys. I spent three hours out at Rewa doing the tour. It is incredible. It is incredible. Uh, the affluent that they have to uh, where they put back into the once you know into the Ridley River because it goes back in. It's so clean you can drink it. As a matter of fact, they regularly will do that in presentations. So this is the water that's just been treated out of this gallon jug, and it has to be that clean um, because what we do, we affect the drinking water for Lake Greenwood, right, or the people of Greenwood right down, uh, right down the way. And actually in that mural, you can see, we tell that story as it goes on down at Lake Greenwood. We also have our other major exhibit upstairs, which is the sustainability exhibit, which we work closely with the Shy Center students, uh, the Shy Center for Sustainability. It was a fantastic um, opportunity to work with a group of, of seniors as their capstone course. Um, and they helped us with, uh, with the exhibitry, give us ideas, 
Um, as a matter of fact, one of the students turned us on to this one type of um, one type of exhibit that he thought would be great for geographic information systems. While we didn't use that exhibit for that, we found the company in South Africa that made it, and we discovered that they already had an entire sustainability exhibit off the shelf in a, in a museum, a science museum in Cape Town. And so we contacted them and it began a two year journey working with Formula D and our sustainability exhibit actually is the first US install of this uh, wonderful exhibit that was designed uh, in South Africa. Um, and, the, and the whole crux of that is that we wanted anyone who comes in there from a three-year-old kid to an adult to learn something that, hey, I can make a difference and help, help um, help preserve the resources that we have. And then we have a dinosaur trail now. Everybody loves the dinosaur trail. So we have 15 and growing life-size dinosaurs that we had just added this past summer and that's open in the afternoons too. And again, I can't tell you how exciting that everyone has been uh, about this. Now, why is what we do important? Because there's been lots of research done for this guys. If you can capture adolescents with, with excitement in the fields of science outside of a formal classroom setting. If you can capture their interests, capture their imagination, they're much more likely to go into those careers. And particularly in middle school age, if you can capture a kid who's in that middle school age range and get them interested in careers in science, then they're much more likely to go into science. What's, amazing, what's interesting is that when kids are, are young, like in kindergarten, uh, first grade, early elementary, you say, how many of you like science? Everybody raises their hand because they like to see how things you know, work and how things you know, blow things up. But it's amazing as you go through the years, by the time you get to middle school and then high school, by the time you get to high school, you say, how many of you like science? Only a handful. And, and I'm not blaming teachers. I am still a teacher at heart despite years of administration. Um, it's how we approach the teaching of science as, we, as kids matriculate through. Um, that we are blessed, that we have the opportunity to help support teachers. We can do things in, with our facilities that classroom teachers can't. We're, we can be the wow factor that a typical classroom teacher can't be. And, and we work hand in glove to provide that for them. So just to give you, uh, a, for instance, how we do what we do. Um, before COVID, uh, the last year we have great numbers on this, we had about 78,000 students in our program attendance, okay? About 78,000 total in our school program attendance. So field trips to Roper Mountain, we average about 50,000 students a year coming to Roper Mountain for field trips. One thing that most people don't realize, if you live in Greenville County and you are a um, public school student, a private school student, or a homeschool student, guess how much it costs to come to Roper Mountain? Nothing. We keep the, a minimal cost outside of that, about 12, we, we just raised our, you know, um, raised our, our prices uh, from $10 to a whopping $12 for a field trip. And comparatively, when you look at all the other opportunities for field trips around, that's extremely cheap. Um, we want to do that intentionally because we want kids to come. We do not want cost to be a prohibitive factor. As a matter of fact, we actually have uh, been blessed to have uh, scholarships provided by companies like Duke. Um, that will allow us to take our science on wheels program out to schools if they can't afford to come. So we our virtual field trips, uh, keep that number in mind, 9,000 the year prior to COVID, COVID. That means that we are going live into classrooms teaching students um, face to face, okay? All over the country, actually into Canada, we've actually connected with Australia, classes in Australia too. Um, our outreach program, Science on Wheels, touches about 21,000 students a year. And then we talked about Science Plus for teachers already. Now, this is a map of where um, our students come from and across the, just the state of South Carolina, because we also draw students from North Carolina and Georgia as well. Um, we offer more than 70 hands-on lessons on site, and that's a lot of offerings. Uh, and we try to keep that, those offerings, uh, a wide variety. And all of our lessons are based on the South Carolina state standards because, again, we exist to support teachers. Now, when the world stopped and everything changed with COVID last year, with how we do education, um, we we've, we've didn't see it as a problem. We saw it as an opportunity to be successful. And so we created 
um, a series of live lessons offered in grades two through eight. Um, new lessons for each grade level created about, let's see, that's, we were doing six lessons every three weeks for each grade level. Live lessons, we connected with students and we offered it free. We said, you know what, we're not going to charge you this, charge anything to anybody. And we're going to open it up to whoever in the nation wants to come. Y'all, we were touching regularly schools up north, out west, in Canada again, that already knew us. And we were able to touch about 109,000 students virtually last year. Almost doubled our impact of what we were able to do on site. It was so successful, teachers would say this often, we really miss being at Roper Mountain and we can't wait to get back dot, dot, dot. But we love this too. Can you keep doing this next year? Because it helps, you know, it allows us to get do so much more with our students in the classroom. And we did. And we, de we have a dedicated person now to just doing that, uh, teaching virtually like that um, in those 30-minute segments to, to uh, students across the, the district and the state. So these are some of the things that teachers say. Um, just some of the comments. Teachers love coming to Ripple Mountain, and students do too. Um, we just love hearing hearing how we change lives. It was just perfect timing before I came today. Um, I have a former student, Kyle Browning, who messaged me last night, and I hadn't talked to Kyle in years. And he said, "But we're Facebook friends." And he said, "Hey, Coach, I just want to let you know my ten-year-old son just came home." from his field trip to Rope Mountain today and said, Dad, I finally figured out what I want to do when I grow up. And he said, what's that, buddy? He said, I want to work at Roper Mountain Science Center. <laughs> and so I just, it, my heart just exploded. Um, and so I shared that with the teachers that he, he you know, that he touched yesterday. And um, I was able to share with Kyle. I said, well, Kyle, we have actually a new staff member we hired last spring who her first experience at Roper Mountain was when she was 10 years old. And she took a summer camp that was about animal care. And she was in charge of taking care of the guinea pig. And she knew at that moment at 10, she wanted to work with animals the rest of her life. She took every summer camp she could until she aged out in eighth grade from that moment on, volunteered at Roper Mountain. And then she went to college and went off and became a marine biologist. She worked at the South Carolina Aquarium until last year when we were able to steal her away. And it wasn't us so much stealing her as when she saw the posting, she was like, I can come back home. And so she's come full circle. So I told Kyle, I said, tell your son that those kind of dreams really do come true. They really do come true. Um, we talked about Science Plus already with our teacher program where we have teachers that we train on site. And just so you'll know, too, right before we, uh, we start to wrap up, I'm going to give you some quest time for some questions. Uh, we do, again, prior to COVID, about 50, almost 50,000 visitors annually with our, um, with our public events. That's from the old Second Saturday program, to the Butterfly Adventure, Laser Shows, the Starry Nights, the Planetarium, which since we renovated the Planetarium, uh, what was that now, three, four years ago? we have almost consistently sold out each month. It's, it's a hard ticket to get in Greenville. Um, so we encourage you to come out for that. And again, if you're a member, it's free. Um, and then our summer camps as well have gone gangbusters. Now, a summer adventure that we started last summer, um, from the, going back to the strategic plan, one, one thing that was consistent from the community is that the community wanted more opportunities to come visit Roper. And so we listened to that. And we said, so how can we make this happen? In the past, we were only open, if you remember, like once a month on the second Saturdays. And then we, had, we were you know, blowing up with summer camps. But this new building, what this new building allowed us to do is then expand our public offerings during the summer. So we could use the bottom of the mountain for public events and the top of the mountain would remain for summer camps. We still have some a uh, handful in Harrison Hall of Science because um, natural science camps are very popular, and on the farm, a few farm camps. But what we were able to do is create this 10-week program called Summer Adventure, and we'll run it from now on. The second Saturday programs, have, as we've known, have kind of gone away right now. Um, we're looking at how we can maybe turn it some more, more popular ones into a weekend experience, but we don't know what it's going to look like yet. But we, now we are now open more to the public than we ever have been in the past. 
Uh, for summer adventure, just to give you an idea, from June 1st to August 7th, we had 33,000 people, almost 34,000 people attend in those 10 weeks. That was with capped numbers. We capped attendance and staggered attendance uh, entry times, just trying to experiment with how people would go and trying to keep you know, buildings not being so people on top of each other. What we discovered is with the addition of this new building plus the dinosaur trail, we don't have to really worry about people being you know, stacked on top of each other. There's so much room for everybody to spread out now all around the mountain. So we'll uncap that next year. And so we anticipate maybe having 40,000 visitors next summer for summer adventure. Um, we now have a cafeteria inside the building. For the first time, we can, start, we can serve hot lunches on the mountain, and it's been fantastic. And what I'm most proud about with that program is this. We designed this kitchen in partnership with Food and Nutritional Services and the Special Education Department of, of Greenville County to provide students who are seeking an employability credential uh, certificate an opportunity to get their job experience here. Now, what is an employability credential certificate? What that is, is this. These are kids who are in the special ed special education track who um, have special needs and not, are not able to earn an academic diploma. Now, we've had this program for years in Greenville County, and um, it's been very successful. Usually what these kids do, they can stay in the program, they can stay in high school until they're 21, um, and they, they perform the academic courses to the degree at which they can, and then they get training in certain areas, like school, um, excuse me, um, custodial services or food services, things like that. In the past, they've had to go to Chick-fil-A or something to work hours or Burger King, something like this. But I don't know if you're aware, just like we have a massive bus driver system, a shortage in, in Greenville County and statewide, we also have a shortage of people to work in our cafeterias. And so... What we're doing is training these kids, instead of going out to Burger King and getting trained, they're getting trained in a Greenville County Schools kitchen with the hope that they'll want to go into this as a career and then we can hire them. This summer, we had a, a young lady named Heaven. And Miss Heaven, I talked to her every morning when she came in. She was one of the students in the program. And Miss Heaven would come in, I'd ask her how she's doing. And I said, Miss Heaven, how are you doing today? She said, I'm doing great. And she said, I said, well, so what do you want to do? Because she was 20 and about to go out of the program. I said, what do you want to do? She said, well, I'm hoping to get hired down at Fountain Inn so I can start making that money. And I'm like, yes, ma'am, I get it. I said, I hope so. Well, I'm, and it, again, it just swells my heart. Heaven did get hired. No favoritism. She got hired at Fountain Inn High School um, to work in the cafeteria. And the great thing about that is that there are other ladies that work in that kitchen that are new to Greenville County's kitchens how they do things, and Heaven was actually able to step into a leadership role and show them what she knew and train them on things that she'd been learning in our, in our system already. So you talk about doing something for a kid. Um, it's been fantastic. So we now have those students working in our cafeteria there, and then um, in the summer, Greenville County Schools is part of the summer feeding program through the USDA. And I'm not sure if you're aware of that. So students can receive a free lunch every day if they're registered and enrolled in a Greenville County school. Even if they're not and they come to a Greenville County facility, they can get a free lunch. And so what that allowed us to do is that if you were 18 and under, you could get a free meal in our cafeteria, which was great for us too, because mamas and daddies are gonna pay for theirs, <laughs> but kids could also eat free and they love that as well. So we served 14,000 meals um, almost well, yeah, 14,000, almost 200 uh, meals in the cafeteria during that time. And then 12,000 of those were to students. We also had 4,800 students, uh, student meals that were delivered through our food truck where they would come through the parking lot. They didn't want to come to the event, but they would just come on campus and pick up their meal. Most of those people who are doing that are ones that are in high need and do need that, need that meal for their children. So that's a, a, been a great opportunity for us to, to share with them. So... Again, that's summer adventure comments. People absolutely love it. And then just to wrap up, summer camps. This past summer, we dropped the number. We limited. Usually we'll go up to like 20, 25. We kept it around 12 or 15 this year. Um, but we anticipate going back to full capacity next year. And so we'll continue to swell our summer, our summer camp program. So with that said, that's a lot. We have a lot going on. And I, and I got to brag on our association still because while this building, this new building, was the first building that Greenville County Schools actually 
paid for on that campus. Okay, they spent, they invested $11 million, almost $12 million in that facility. And it's beautiful. You need to, need to come see it yourself. But the association also um, took on the task of raising $3 million. Uh, well, our goal is like $3.5 million uh, to put in the permanent exhibitry. So the school, build, the school district built the building and said, you guys are on the hook for the exhibits. Fair enough. That's how we've always operated. And so um, through our, through our um, gracious partners in the community, uh, business partners, as well as individuals, uh, we've gotten $3 million of the 3.5 raised so far. So we're continuing that, that capital campaign. But um, we've been very blessed with community support. And we'd love to talk with any of you guys who would love to um, participate in some way. Matter of fact, what, was, what we've seen in the last couple of years and really this past summer, we've been hitting hard our volunteer, our adult volunteer program. And so we have more adult docents now than we've ever had in our past. And um, we're, we're always looking for people that volunteer in the summer. If, you can, if it's just a day for a few hours, we'll take you. But if you would love to get involved with that, then we'd love to have you. Um, because it's so much fun to work at this place and you just see people's faces light up when they're here. So with that, can I answer any questions? Yes, ma'am. A couple questions. Let me get over here oh. so everyone can hear you. We got people on Zoom. so we. Oh, got... yeah. Your presentation was excellent. Thank you. Um, I want to know, you had outdoor paths where you could do picnicking and have picnics with the kids and everything. That continues, do you have that area still or is that taken up with the new building? Right, so we do have that, thank you for that. We do have the uh, outdoor path still on um, the nature trails, um, but that, all, that model has all changed now due to increased safety regulations as well as our ticketed events and the afternoon explorations. So that is now part of the ex afternoon explorations program. So you can still access that um, when you, through you know, getting a ticket for afternoon explorations. Uh, in the afternoons, but um, the way it was so open in the past has not been, uh, we're not, we haven't been able to continue that. And you still have the Golden Teachers Award where retired Greenville County teachers. Golden Circle, yes. Yeah, yes. we still get in free, um, or is that still like that? Golden Circle, I I, have, I would have to check on that. I can give you my card and I can, you can email me that, but I'm, I'm not sure because there was some, there was some discussion about Golden Circle. And I, I think that may still be, but I'll, I'll look at that soon. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions on Zoom, Sarah or Jessica? Not here. Okay. Any other questions? Looks like you got about three in chat. All right. Let's see. Yeah. Got one. Oh, okay. All right. Let me well, see if I can. I can't read it. <laughs> Oh, please share your questions in chat. <laughs> if there's no other questions, every time I do Lunch and Learn, and we've been doing this for a few years now, we get speakers like Thomas and others, and we realize what a great place Greenville is to live. And uh, how fortunate we are to have something like Roper Mountain in our back door, and that we get an opportunity to visit it. And uh, we certainly thank Thomas for coming. And I know that my wife and I will be out there with our grandchildren this summer. And I hope all of you will too. It's a wonderful place and uh, certainly be anxious to see all the improvements. Thank you for speaking to us. Today. Thank you. Thank you.